On April 12, 2014, agents from the Bureau of Land Management found themselves surrounded by hundreds of armed and angry militiamen backing a Nevada rancher in the desert. We're going to go and take our land back and declare freedom and liberty here in this land. There to enforce a court order to seize his cattle, they were not prepared for what they faced. What was supposed to be a peaceful protest quickly threatened to boil over. A decades-long fight between rancher Clive and Bundy and the federal government over grazing rights quickly became a clarion call for the anti-government movement to mobilize. Militia members and supporters streamed in from around the nation. Suddenly, federal and local authorities were facing the threat of anti-government extremists ready to act on their violent beliefs. Snipers took up strategic positions on the hillsides above, their rifles aimed directly at the agents. The officers were outnumbered and outgunned. Fearing bloodshed, they wisely retreated. Yet that decision emboldened militias, sovereign citizens, and angry, self-styled patriots. At the time, the situation was unlike any other in recent memory. Not since the 1990s had militias been so willing to defy law enforcement. retired ATF Special Agent in charge, Jim Cavanaugh. I spent 33 years with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and I know firsthand just how dangerous it can be when an ideology fueled by blind rage turns against the federal government. In the 1990s, we saw it in Oklahoma City, where Timothy McVeigh killed 168 people with a massive truck bomb placed at a federal building. Today, we're facing a similar threat. Since 2008, we've seen a dramatic resurgence of what is known as the anti-government movement. There were 998 of these groups in 2015. That's up from a low of 149 just seven years earlier. But the sentiment behind that rise was not confined to the extremist fringe. A 2015 Pew study, for example, found that only 19% of Americans felt they could trust the federal government. Amid that backdrop, it is no surprise that some people began to view taking up arms against that same government as the answer. The 2014 standoff in the Nevada desert was only the beginning of a surge in anti-government actions that threatened violence. About six weeks after the standoff, a newlywed couple that had gone to the Bundy Ranch walked into a pizza parlor in Las Vegas determined to spark a revolution. They killed two police officers at point-blank range on one officer's body, they draped the Don't Tread on Me flag, one of the calling cards of the anti-government movement. In South Texas, heavily armed men in camouflage began organizing patrols and sentry posts. They believed the government was failing to protect the border. They operated out of a base they called Camp Lone Star and claimed their mission was to, quote, push back the illegals. The leader of the group, Casey Massey, began collecting materials that could be used to make explosives. He and another man were arrested on federal weapons charges. The following summer, armed militiamen rushed to defend two Oregon gold miners who were in a dispute with the government. They were backed by the Oath Keepers, a group of tactically trained former military and police personnel. For six weeks, they turned the hills surrounding the mine into a patrol base. They were ready for war. Then, in January 2016, militia extremists flocked to the town of Burns, Oregon to support two ranchers sentenced to prison for starting fires on public lands. After a peaceful protest on January the 2nd, a small contingent of armed men stormed a nearby federal wildlife refuge. They occupied it for 41 days. Two of Clive and Bundy's sons led the occupation. Numerous others came and went. They threatened to kill or be killed in defense of their version of law and liberty. They wanted the federal government to give up its ownership of federal lands in the West. The occupiers claimed to be representing the people of the area, but most locals felt differently. These events may have happened far from your community, but no area of the country is immune. In some urban areas, militias have begun conducting training exercises in preparation for a time when they believe they will be first responders. Sometimes they may show up in volatile situations. For example, 
During the civil unrest after an officer involved shooting in Ferguson, Missouri, members of the Oath Keepers walked the streets in body armor, openly carrying assault rifles. Others in the anti-government movement called on volunteers to monitor law enforcement movements and track key events and locations of both the rioters and responders. Increasingly, communities nationwide have become focal points in a fight law enforcement didn't want and officers are put in positions they never expected. If your town is being targeted, here are some common indicators. Widespread community anger over the government's treatment of an individual, group, or movement. Calls to action, often in the form of community meetings and public protests, many times focusing on authority figures. Escalating discussions and alerts on social media. National anti-government leaders suddenly taking an interest in your community. And finally, appearance of militia members in your area. They are usually armed, they may be wearing paramilitary outfits, or just civilian clothes, but they will advertise their militia affiliation or any government ideology in some form. Stickers, patches, emblems, or flags. They may even sport familiar patriotic symbols, but with a twist. Once the militia appears, the potential for conflict increases. Your response becomes critical. The militia not only targets your community, it targets your department. Officers are portrayed as pawns of the government and an enemy of the people. Las Vegas Metro Police Sergeant Tom Jenkins knows this all too well. Jenkins was among 30 Las Vegas cops called in to keep the peace at the Bundy standoff in 2014. As tensions mounted, Jenkins and his colleagues found themselves facing an angry and growing crowd that was hundreds strong. Jenkins later told a reporter that police didn't show any fear but said, quote, I tell you, in the back of our minds, we thought that could be our last day on earth. In South Alabama, Law enforcement encountered a different kind of threat from any government activists. Local and county officers begin to see people who call themselves sovereign citizens acting like law enforcement. A national group called the Republic for the United States of America have been quietly training its members to patrol the areas and monitor law enforcement. Armed and uniformed men soon begin confronting officers on patrol. What started as gatherings at a local restaurant evolved into a situation where extremists were openly brandishing weapons and fake badges. The threat isn't always physical. There's also the danger that any government ideology can reach into the ranks of law enforcement. Militias and their supporters are trying hard to persuade officers to adopt their false interpretation of American law and history. They believe that if they can get a sheriff, a chief of police, or an officer on patrol to take their side, their chances of defying the federal government are greater. Well, I'm going over to meet the sheriff in Grant County. Get you come along with us, and you talk with us over there. You can go ahead and shoot me. They may say that the federal government has no authority over your area. They may say that sheriffs are the highest law enforcement authority in the land. They may even show you documents they believe prove their claims. They may invoke your oath of office. Anti-government activist John Ritzheimer recently called on militias to demand that local officials uphold their version of the law. You're too busy rolling around out there shooting at tree stumps that you can't sit there and do the real work. Get an indictment, present it to the sheriff. If they don't uphold the law, that's where the militia come in. Extremists sometimes call for citizens' grand juries that they wrongly believe can indict government officials. Don't be fooled. What they are asking in the guise of upholding your oath may lead you to break the laws you've sworn to enforce. They are preying on your patriotism. It's a deal with the devil. You can protect yourself and save the lives of others by understanding the nature of this threat how to prepare for it, and what to do if it appears in your community. If a confrontation occurs, trust your training. Stay steady and wait them out. It's important to know that any government extremists are looking for a fight. They are waiting for you to cross the line that they've drawn in the sand. Don't. Using lessons learned from Waco, a siege in Montana in 1996 ended peacefully after almost three months of patient negotiation. But when the danger has passed, move swiftly to hold those who break the law accountable. 
At the 2016 occupation in Oregon, law enforcement waited for the right moment to begin making a series of arrests. Eventually, 25 people were arrested. Have local law enforcement out front. One of the major law enforcement successes of the Oregon standoff was putting local and state authorities in the foreground while the FBI worked behind the scenes. That is not insignificant when dealing with the anti-government movement which views the federal government as the enemy. These extremists are more likely to engage in discussions and reach a peaceful resolution when dealing with local authorities. Collective wisdom counts. Remember, you don't have to go it alone. Working as a team across all levels of law enforcement was crucial in ending the refuge standoff. Seek advice and additional resources from other agencies. Get your message out. Communication is critical. Let your neighbors know just what these outside forces represent. While the anti-government movement claims to be restoring law and order, it is not. Instead, it is creating tension and fear. Militias seek to define conflicts as patriots versus the government. But in Oregon, people reacted in a way the occupiers did not expect. The public was resentful and openly voiced opposition. Without local support, the reality became apparent. It was criminals versus the community. The law enforcement community has learned many lessons from dealing with anti-government extremists, both in the 1990s and in more recent years. They are armed, many have extensive training with weapons and explosives, and some are ready to be martyred for their cause. There have been deaths on both sides. Since 2010, seven law enforcement officers have been killed during violent encounters with anti-government extremists. During the refuge standoff, the primary militia spokesman was shot and killed as law enforcement attempted to arrest him and the Bundy brothers. Lavoie Finnicum became a martyr to the anti-government cause and rallies in honor of him have spread across the nation, planting the seeds of distrust and anger in communities far and wide. So know that the events of the last three years are not merely history to the movement. They are calls to arms. The members of the anti-government movement are false patriots who are primed for a fight. Don't give it to them. Thanks for your service, and thank you for really upholding the Constitution. Thank you.